FDA and the 3M earplug lawsuits, a $6 billion hit to 3M. But what role does the FDA play in all of this? After all, we're, we're talking about human health here, right? This hearing loss involved, this uh, military earplugs, and if we show it here on the iPad, uh, 3M acquired a company called Aero, really interesting name there, Aero. You see the word ear uh, right in the middle of that? There we go, Aero. And they make uh, these, they're now a division of 3M. They make these, these earplugs, these two-sided earplugs. Well, they did. They're not on the market anymore uh, because leading up to this, hundreds of lawsuits um, accusing hearing loss uh, in military personnel, tens of thousands of these sold to the military, now a $6 billion settlement um, where 3M is going to pay out $6 billion. I think it was $5 billion in cash and a billion in shares to those who have been uh, been hurt by this. And the question really comes up, what what happened here? And we are not here to say that we have a firm clue. I mean, obviously this is up to the courts to decide. But what happened, let's go all the way back. How are these things regulated? If you go to ANSI, American National Standards Institute, you will read this really interesting uh, article. And it says, in 1974, ANSI S3.19-1974, there's a uh, technique for measuring hearing protectors. 1974, a technique for calculating the noise reduction rating. You see that NRR on every single package of hearing protectors you pass in the store? Well, it turns out this has long since been superseded. There's a new ANSI standard out that replaced it over 30 years ago, but, but, the 1974 standard, if we look right here, uh, it's had several successors, but the EPA, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, still requires the testing to the 1974 standard. And it includes a method using 10 human subjects, which I thought was really interesting. Like, it's not a completely objective test either. And it's still required under 40 CFR Part to 11. So this is still how these things are tested. And then you see the ANSI uh, label on the package in the store, and you feel confident that these things are going to protect your hearing. Well, it turns out it gets a little bit complicated because if we go back here, these 3M uh, arrow hearing protectors, the combat arms version two hearing protectors, the accusations that, that came out, and apparently the jury ruled in favor uh, of, the, of the accusers here, they were accusing all sorts of things like falsifying test results. Um, they were saying that tests were fudged. They were saying that they got a minus two decibel result out of the hearing protectors. Minus two in this case would mean Let's see, if, if 20 means we're protecting your hearing, we're going to go to our audio engineer and we're going to say, Steve, what would minus 2 mean if, if 20 is protecting your hearing for 20 decibels? That means they're making things louder. Yeah, it actually makes it look like they amplify, but they didn't report that apparently as a minus 2. They reported it as a 0. And this was a perk because they were trying to say that these things would allow you to hear voices around you but they'd shut off really, really loud sounds. And, and apparently this was not happening. So the, the fact of the case, you can, you can you know, read about anywhere. You can go to the docket. We've got that linked in the um, YouTube description. You can find out all the, all the legal and technical details. But here's where I wanted to focus today. What about FDA? We're talking about human health. We're talking about hearing loss after all. Doesn't FDA get involved in this? And this is a really fascinating deep dive because what we saw a moment ago is EPA seems to be regulating hearing protectors in the U.S. And they're regulating hearing protectors based on a 1974 standard. And that's all fine and good. But if we look here, they are unclassified by FDA. They're unclassified. They've actually been given a product code, EWD. But FDA hasn't said, are these class one? Are they class two? Are they class three? And the submission type, get this, sometimes people are looking for this for their products, is enforcement discretion. The submission type is enforcement discretion, which basically says FDA is saying, 
yes, this would count as a medical device, but we are choosing to ignore it. We are choosing to look the other way. Now, we know that they do things like health and wellness devices like that. Yeah, we could take this measuring exercise bicycle and we could call it a medical device and we're not giving up that authority. We're just going to exercise enforcement discretion. And that's how it is with hearing aids, or I'm sorry, not hearing aids, uh, hearing protectors. They're exercising enforcement discretion. Therefore, the product is unclassified with FDA. It turns out that it's not GMP exempt. Good manufacturing practices are still considered to be required. Well, but if you're exercising enforcement discretion, when are you ever going to check that FDA? And the answer is they're not. They're not going to check that. There's no 510K to be submitted. There's no uh, registration should technically be required. But once again, enforcement discretion. We're just not going to check in on this. We're going to leave it to the EPA and this 1974 standard. Now, mind you, I'm not judging this. I'm not saying this is the right thing or the wrong thing. That will be uh, something that the pundits can argue about all the time. In fact, I've had discussions with friends who say, well, how often do these things go wrong? We've talked about deregulation with FDA in other contexts. Another one that we did on the show was radio frequency ID tags. Radio frequency ID tags not getting tested to the current level in certain products where a 510K wasn't required anymore. So no one checked in. It wouldn't have been a hard thing. No one bothered to check in and say, are you using the right standard? Are you complying with it? The company self-certified, off they went, and 300 adverse events and injuries were, were reported. So deregulation is kind of a mixed bag. You're making it easier for companies to get products on the market, and that is an objectively good thing. But when we see these things slip through, where if somebody had just been checking test reports, maybe we wouldn't be in this situation. Again, we're not taking a position on that. That is for others to argue about. But it is fascinating that FDA is waiving their oversight of hearing protectors, leaving it to a 1974 standard and the Environmental Protection Agency to regulate. But it's not the case that people don't register these devices. Names as prominent as Etymotic Research, uh, Strand Industries, which makes the well-known Eargasm earplugs, Honeywell Safety Products, even Uline, the uh, commercial industrial uh, supply house, they're all registered with FDA for hearing protectors as manufacturers, contract manufacturers, specification developers, repackagers, relabelers. So it's not that people aren't going to FDA and saying, I know this is enforcement discretion. Hey, just wanted to let you know, we know we're making what amounts to a medical device and we're going to register with you. There are people out there doing it. Would that have solved problems in this case? Who's to say? We're not going to, we're not going to judge that. But this is the question that I think is, is really, really interesting. Hearing protectors are, we think of them as just these little foam plugs that stick in your ear. Not so the Combat Arms version 2 devices from Aero and, and 3M. Relatively complex. The triple baffled design on two ends, one end uh, designed to completely block sound off. The other design uh, intended to uh, let some sound through. So relatively complex design. And we might say to ourselves, well, these things over here, these, these hearing protectors, they wouldn't need a 510K. They don't need anybody auditing that. Foam is foam. But of course, when you make something that's this complex, it does have the potential to fail. Would it have been more appropriate to have these reviewed? How do you judge that? Things get lumped into categories. Again, we can't judge. But we do find it very, very interesting. And you can read the docket about all the failures that happen, the testing failures, the uh, testing changes, the deviations from testing protocol that happened. Um, and um, unfortunately for quite a few military servicemen and women, uh, permanent hearing loss or tinnitus uh, that has resulted from this six billion in counting in damages to 3M. What can we learn as a med tech development community? Well, 
It's that sometimes just a little bit of oversight isn't a terrible thing. Somebody to at least check the work. I think one of the tensions we see in our community is that sometimes FDA seems to be staring at the head of the pin, asking questions that don't matter. But other times, if we could all just follow a process that makes sure we're testing to the most current standards, everyone would be better off. It's that balance in regulation that's always so hard to hit. And when we talk on the show so often about the design control process and the verification and validation that comes along with medical product development, that's why those things are important. So that you can at least show, hey, look, we tried to address this issue, this issue, and this issue, and that's why we're putting this product on the market. We believe it to be safe and effective. If you found this interesting, please be sure to like and subscribe. That's what we hope on MedTech Crossroads, that the things that we provide to you for free will save you time and effort and headaches on your MedTech development journey.